There we go. Cool. All right, so recording. Good to go here. Let's start working on more addition, more about addition reactions. So this was the first page of your practice of your class assignment. So like I said, we'll go over that in a little bit. Unless anybody has any specific questions right now on the known here. Anything you got up on? So one to two is always going to be the double bonds when we're dealing with the cyclo structure. Okay. So we would we would still want to keep the bromine as low as possible, but it would so we would be counting. We'd be counting from here to start one, two, three. One second. All right. So let's get back to some additional questions. Um, so remember that this was our, our first addition reaction that we added, and our mechanism is going to look something like something like this, where you're going to start by having those extra electrons in the pi bond are going to be attracted to the proton from an acid. So you wind up with. You end up with these electrons moving over here. Bromine takes its electrons and goes home. And you're going to wind up with what is our intermediate? What does that do? We break a pi bond between two carbons and turn it into a sigma bond between one carbon and a hydrogen. What's left out of that situation? What's not going to be stable? The bromide. What else has a charge though? We didn't change the number of electrons on our alkene, right? We just broke one of the bonds, one of the covalent bonds that was satisfying two carbons at the same time. And so now we wind up with here's our new hydrogen we just added. And on the other carbon, we have a positive charge. And so it's again, it's the same intermediate that we would get for the elimination reaction. If we went through an E1 elimination reaction, we would get the same thing happening as our intermediate, right? Because the first thing that happens in an E1 is leaving the fleets, and then a hydrogen is pulled off. Here we add a hydrogen, but the nucleophile, which would have been our leaving group if it was going backwards, is still floating around. Right? And if you're ever unsure if you drew a mechanism step right, one of the ways you can check your work is that your charges need to add up on both sides of the mechanism arrow, right? Everything was neutral on the left hand side. Not everything's neutral after this step, but it all adds up to zero. And that tells us that we didn't blue gain or lose electrons anywhere in there. And so then our second step in this case. Would be a nucleophile attacks a carbocation. So that's the same exact step as uh, an SN1, right? An SN1, when the leaving group leaves, you make a carbocation intermediate, and then a nucleophile comes along and sticks on there, right? The same exact thing here, we just got to our intermediate from a different starting point. And then our final product here. Do we need to worry about stereochemistry on the product? 
we have any asymmetric carbons? What's an asymmetric carbon? The fact that I keep asking about it is a pretty good hint, right? That carbon where the nucleophile added has four unique things attached to it, right? It still has a hydrogen attached. It's got a methyl and an ethyl and whatever our nucleophile is. So unless our nucleophile happens to be a methyl group or an ethyl group or a hydrogen, which would be a hydride, which can happen, but that's not the case in this reaction. So we do wind up needing to think about it at least, but are we going to make just one stereoisomer or both of them? Both, we're starting from planar, right? That carbocation has P2, so it's flat. So our nucleophile can come from on top or bottom, just like SM1, right? So we would wind up with, if we wanted to fully show our work for full credit here, we would want to say R plus S or draw both versions of it. So which of those steps is going to be slower? Which is the rate determining step? Five bond breaking, right? And why? We have just a pure Coulombic attraction between a positive and a negative. Plus, What's a carbocation doesn't have a full valence, right? So that's inherently unstable compared to our starting point where everything had a full valence. It might still be reactive, bromide's a strong acid, so it's gonna try to be giving away a proton, but at the very least, everything has a full valence. So you're starting from something that's relatively stable, and then we wind up making something less stable. So that's usually going to be our slowest step. If we're making an intermediate that's less stable than we started with. What would the rate law look like? What would we expect it to look like? So that's a potential energy service, right? So the potential energy service surface, excuse me, would look something like you start from something kind of stable, go way up in energy, make something less stable. We end with something that's more stable than what we started with, right? Because I bonds are inherently less stable than sigma bonds. There's less overlap, right? So if we're making something that's all sigma bonds from something with pi bonds, that's usually down to in energy overall. So with that in mind, our rate determining step is this first step. What does the rate law look like? That's remember rate equals. But close. So we, they're both involved because we need the proton to run into the uh, alkene, right? To start the first step. All that you're really missing, you gotta remember the rate constant is in there too. And really, it's it's you can actually have this reaction started with any acid, right? It doesn't have to be HBr. Whatever your nucleophile is gonna wind up being is usually the conjugate base of your acid, but it doesn't have to be. You can use things where you could use, say, sodium bromide and sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is a better acid, so it can act as a strong acid to start the reaction. And then bromide comes in and attaches to the, the because bromide is a better nucleophile than hydrogen sulfate. So a lot of times you'll see acid as a catalyst to start a reaction. It can be any acid. Um, but in this case, yeah, we would say. You need the acid to start things. And it has to run into your alkene.
And so in theory, if you change your concentration of either the acid or the um, alkene, you're going to slow down the reactor, change the rate of the reaction. And so just a, a note about, um, about rates in general, because today's lab, we're going to be doing similar stuff, talking about rate loss for substitutions. Same rules apply. Your slowest step determines your rate loss. And whatever has to bump into each other in your slowest step is going to be in your rate loss. Right? Because if you need them to bump into each other for something to happen, then if you change the, how much you have to be there, you're changing your probability they happen to run into each other, right? If we make some, let's make up a, a funny example. Um, I, would, I would like to use cars running into each other as a good, you know, it's a good way of understanding kind of how reactions happen. Things have to hit each other the right way. Let's say you can only have a fender bender in South Lake Tahoe, and if it's a Tesla running into a Toyota. If you change the amount of Teslas you have, you change the rate that that can happen, right? All of a sudden, you're only getting fender benders on the weekend. That's kind of how it works anyway. But, um, so, but whatever is involved has to be there by changing either of those amounts. If for some reason everybody ran out and sold their Toyotas, then it doesn't matter how many Teslas we have on the weekend, you still can't get a Tesla or need a Toyota. All right, so when it comes to which, so in this, in this reaction here, it didn't really matter which way we drew. If you see the, the way that I drew the mechanism first, put the positive charge on the top carbon. But those are really, the two carbons are really identical, right? So it's not really any difference between where I put them and, and it doesn't really affect what our final product is either. Way. We get the same, it's still going to be two bromo butane regardless of which way I drew it in the intermediate, right? If it's not symmetrical though, then the stability of the intermediate is gonna govern which product we make. So just like with elimination reactions, we were looking at sterics and things like that to determine which of two possibilities is more likely. With addition reactions, we do the same sort of thing, except it's all going to be governed by carbocation stability. That's the most important factor. And so it's tied to sterics a little bit, but it's really more about hyperconjugation, which is that word we defined once when we were first talking about carbocation stability, and then we never really used it again. But remember, it's just that idea that if you have a, a carbocation, so here's a methyl carbocation, um, you've got an empty P orbital on that carbon, right? If you surround that empty P orbital with other carbon hydrogens, carbon hydrogen bonds, or even just any, any other tetrahedral carbons around it, those tetrahedral carbons have these sigma bonds that can sort of donate electron density over to that empty orbital. They don't do it in 100%, this is kind of part of the mechanism for how elimination reactions happen, right? If you happen to have this setup and a really good base happen to flow by. You could see how it would turn into an FA pi bond, right? Because it looks a lot like a pi bond. It's basically a, a frustrated pi bond trying to be a pi bond to fill that carbon valence, but you have to have something to take the hydrogen away in order for that to have to make a full pi bond. So hyperconjugation makes it seem like it's more important than normal conjugation, which is not the case. Normal conjugation and resonance is a bigger deal. This only basically gets used as a way to, to talk about our rules for carbocation stability. Um, but what does this idea lead to in terms of what is our, our rule for carbocation stability? Well, 
What's the most stable carbocation? Motor substituted, right? So a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary. And a secondary is about the same as a lilic or benzoic. So remember, that's when you have a, an alkene adjacent or a benzene ring adjacent where you can have resonance happening. And then primary. And then methyl. Right, so that means that if we have a choice between when we're breaking a pi bond, if we have a choice of where to put the positive charge for our intermediate, it's always going to go on the more substituted carbon or the carbon that allows us, allows us to have more resonance. Right, so for instance, here's a good example. If it's just asking what the reaction produces, you don't need to draw the intermediate, but it can still be helpful. So if we had something like two, two methyl protein, when we add that H, our intermediate is going to, we have two choices. We can either make this our intermediate or Make that our intermediate, right? We could put the positive charge on either side. And really, it's more that we could put the hydrogen on either side of the pi bond where pi bond starts. And that puts a positive charge on the other side. Right. And so that means that this is going to control which isomers we see. And this is actually a lot more um, specific of a rule than. When we were talking about uh, elimination reactions in, in Zaysa versus Hoffman, we said that that was like a 70 30 ratio. We were going to get both options, right? Um, in measurable amounts. This is that's not the case here. Because this, the rules of carbocation stability, tertiary is so much more stable than secondary, which is so much more stable than primary. You essentially don't get any of the opposite isomers. And that is that. That rule. Um, Markovnikov's rule. So Zayt Sev, remember I told you Zayt Sev was working in another group with, with um, somebody else who was working on rules for alkene stability. It was Markovnikov. Markovnikov was, his, I don't know if he was an advisor or just an older student in the same group. Um, but Markovnikov really didn't like Zayt Sev. Didn't think, I, I looked up a quote one time with something along the lines that told um, Zayt Sev's um, prelim committee, like, basically, this guy doesn't even belong in a university. He's he is so far out of his league, he will never amount to anything. But full on just told a whole room full of this guy's professors about that. So then they said it was fairly justified in my mind by waiting for Markov and to put his foot in his mouth and then publishing his paper to say that Markov and was wrong when it came to alpha stability. Um, but Markov and still gets his name known because he also was a very bright guy. Um, and he was the one who came up with the rule that said basically it's, it's going around how or the carbocation stability just says you put the nucleophile on the more substituted carbon. It basically removes the intermediate from it entirely. Partly because this was back in the late 1800s when the ideas of intermediates and things like that were not as well understood. But what he was able to say is it's like more like a, a law. He was able to observe it but not explain it. Um, was that you put the nucleophile on the more substituted carbon? 
All right, and it winds up still being used because just like with Zayt said and Hoffman, we use we have different mechanisms. It turns out it's not a hard rule where every single time follows. Most of the time, most addition reactions are Markov Nikolaev additions. But there are a couple classes that are anti Markov Nikolaev. And those are the ones where we can very specifically add our nuclear bile to the less substitute side because we basically go through a different potential energy pathway. So assuming that HBr, so this is, this is what's known as hydrobromination. So hydro, because you're adding a hydrogen to one side, bromination, because you add a bromine to the other side. So for hydrobromination, it's a Markovnikov mechanism. So what is the product we're going to get through to this? Are we changing anything about any of the carbons? No, carbons aren't changing, right? So when I ask you to draw a product and you know that the mechanism is not changing any carbon-carbon bonds, you can always just start by drawing all your sigma bonds for all your carbons, put them all in the same spot because might as well get that out of the way. And what's the net rule or net result of one of these reactions, of doing these addition reactions? What are we really doing overall? Skip the intermediate part. What's the net result? What do you start with? What do you end with? Bromine You end up with a brominated alkane and you start with from an alkene, right? So for these addition reactions, we're always starting from an alkene and you're just going to break the alkene and you're going to add one thing to each side. You have to bring some electrons into the system now because you're breaking a pi bond. So you need to add something that can make an extra sigma bond. Right? And so unless there's any sort of weird cargo cation rearrangement that is happening, it's always just going to be break a pi bond and add something to each side. Which is what do you add to which side? So in this case, we wind up adding hydrogen to the primary carbon here. We add the bromine. We add the bromine to the tertiary carbon. We make any stereoisomers, any symmetric centers. No, because both ways around that ring are the same still, right? You can't, if you try to go both directions around this ring and assign priority, you get an exact tie every time, right? So if it's exactly the same, you can't assign priority, it must not be two distinct substituents. If there was another methyl group here, now all of a sudden you can tell the difference because going around one way, you get to the methyl group first. And after one step, you go the other way, it takes four steps to get to the methyl group. So a substituted ring would make things more complicated, but that's not what we started with. So we're good. Want to make sure we're paying attention to that still. How about let's save let's save the second one for a second. What about the third? Breaking a pi bond, putting a hydrogen on one side and bromine on the other. So where does the bromine go? Methyl. Good. And then how about that, this last example? Does it matter where we put the bromine? Probably 
Yeah. Both of the carbons are secondary carbons, right? So we're going to get, we're going to put the bromine on either of these two carbons. And since both of those carbons are identical, it doesn't really matter which one we pick. In the case that, let's say we, there was one extra carbon, so it wasn't truly symmetrical, they're both secondary carbons, but one of them, it has an ethyl attached, and so we wind up with two different products, right? We get two bromopentane and three bromopentane, because since they're both symmetrical, you can make both of those um, intermediates relatively the same rate. We have a close to a 50 50 mixture of two bromo pentane and three bromo pentane as the results. And last but not least, what's the extra wrinkle for the second one here? There's two pi bonds. So, what is our intermediate going to look like? The two pi bonds are identical, really, right? So it doesn't really matter which one we break. Let's say we started by making our new hydrogen bond right there, which gives us a positive charge here. Does that really affect our next step? It would be an issue with resonance. Because this intermediate can resonate to make a different intermediate that would look like this. And so we have resonance between those two. Let me clean this up so we can draw right next to each other. That so here's one intermediate, our second intermediate. We can draw our resonance errors between the two. Which of those is more stable, the major contributor? The one we started with, right? So we have an intermediate that has two resonance structures. Remember, these aren't two different intermediates. I might misspoke earlier if I said something along those lines. I apologize. Remember, all of a sudden, when we're dealing with resonance, it's not a choice, it's both at the same time. So, with that in mind, we're going to get both of these versions reacting with the nucleophiles to some extent, but the, the major contributor is more likely. To react. So our major product is one that comes from here. So but our second product, our secondary product would look like Look like this. We do have this is one where there's a lot of variables going on where it'd be difficult to, to even to even spitball and come up with any sort of reasonable estimate for what the percentages might look like. Because for starters, our top isomer has an R and an X, right? So we're considering those two different molecules. Yeah, that might be our major product, but it's split in half into these two different stereo isomers. So if it was 60%, but then you take that 60% and you split it in two, because you really get 30% R, 30% S, which all of a sudden means the other one is now the major product of 
Right? So it can get a little bit dicey to say what is the single preferred product. We would still usually say this. The other thing that can really cause that not really cause an issue, um, but is something to remember is that rules of alkene stability, they said rule, says that a more substituted alkene is more stable. And the more substituted alkene comes from the less, the minor resonance contributor, which is weird. So it's a little bit tricky to say exactly which one of these is going to be the preferred product. If, if I'm taking one of my tests and trying to answer this question, and I'm not sure, I know I've got all that's going on in my head at the same time on a testing situation, I'm trying to get all my credit. I'm drawing just like this and say, I think this should be the major product. And then if I'm really hedging on it, I might just write, however, due to the nature of the rule, maybe this one might be more stable, you know, just so that you, so that whoever's grading it knows that you're taking that into account. That doesn't really help on a standardized multiple choice test um, because they don't typically look at your chicken scratch when they're grading those. But um, for this class, you can always explain your logic and at least let me get part of the credit, right? And mainly, I would not expect you to go into it in that detail for this question. It just said draw the preferred product. Drawing the top one, especially if you said R plus S, would be all I was really looking for. So, also, um, this is raises the question that there's the other companies like the other side on the napkin and transition, and then is that product a preferred trans be more or less likely? So, it comes down to stoichiometry. If you have one equivalent of HDR relative to your butene, you're going to get predominantly the product that has in brackets. Um, if you have two equivalents of HDR, it happens twice. You break both pi bonds, and you do it sequentially too. So you wind up you wind up probably with two, three dihedral butene as your major product. Um, with a significant amount of one three diagonal because this that's the eraser. This could turn around and react with HDR10. This could turn around and react with HDR10. Um, and really you don't want to adjust those because you know especially if you have if you have one of the one HDR we would say that the reaction happens once, but really there's a statistically significant chance, especially at high concentrations, that one of your products then turns around and grabs another HDR before it has a chance to react with it. A di a diene. Remember the uh, this type of molecule is called a diene. So you would wind up with some small amount, especially if you are at high concentration of HDR or butene, you wind up with a measurable amount of Diagram of butane as a product, and you would have some left over one three butadiene as well. But most of it, based on law of large numbers and statistics and probability, you're predominantly going to get one HDR reacting with one diene. We just have to go off of statistics because we can't really control that, right? Um, one way you can control that is to go really low concentrations. If you're at really low concentrations, the reaction will happen slower, but it also decreases the odds of an already reacted product reacting again. Because usually, until you get to the end of the reaction, you don't have very much of that already reacted product floating around. And high concentrations tend to favor lots of side reactions because lots of things are possible when you have all sorts of stuff pumping into each other. But if you've ever seen, I know not all of you go around and read up on organic synthesis in your spare time, but if you've ever read um, a procedure that says something along the lines of um, at low concentration or you know add slowly or you know, you, usually what that's trying to do is trying to manipulate the concentration so that you can favor going down one path 
instead of causing those sort of side reactions. We'll go back to the traffic analogy. Um, you're less likely to have people cutting through north of or trucking to get to Highway 50 if there's not a lot of traffic. If there's a lot of traffic, the odds somebody will decide to go around the Y instead of just taking 50 like normal goes up, right? So when there's extra pressure on the system because of high concentration, you get other pathways wind up being used, which means you get other products sometimes. Product in that case would be a ticket, I think this was a ticket to make my recommendation from North Upper Truck today. All right. Did the change noticeably if we use HCL instead of HDR? Not really, right? Our, our nucleophile changes, but it's still the same mechanism. And it still follows our same rules for carbocation stability, right? So it's not really good. So the fact that bromine is a better nucleophile than a perfect solvent um, or is you know, it's larger, has more sterics. None of that plays a role in carbocation stability, right? So it might mess with the rates a little bit because better being a better nucleophile or being a larger molecule can affect things. But for the most part, it's the exact same thing. You're just going to get chloride attached instead of bromine. So let's extend that one step further and then we'll take a break. Hydration. So, so this if HBR was hydrobromination, what do we suppose we call HCL being added? Hydrochlorination. If we use water as our nucleophile. We have a slightly different thing happening. We just call it hydration. Hydration literally means add water to something, right? So a hydration reaction is an addition reaction where you have water acting as your nucleophile. So as the slide notes, we only really see this in acidic conditions. Why might not that? Why might that be the case? We still have we still have a nucleophile and a proton there, right? Because we split H two O up. If we split H2O up, just like an acid, we still get a conjugate base that can act as a nucleophile, and we still have a proton, just like with um, HCl and HDR. So why would we need extra acid around? What's the difference about water versus HCl and HDR? It's a weak nucleophile. It's a weak nucleophile and but concentration of protons. Our first step was break the pi bond with the proton, right? Technically, we have a proton here that could donate. It could donate. We could have a reaction that looks like that looks just like our others before. That's possible, right? Does water give up its proton as easily as HCl and HDR does? So it's a weak nucleophile, but it's also that it's a weak acid. HBR and HCl are strong acids. They're really good at letting go of that proton. So if you have HBR and HCl around, you have, they might not be free protons, but they're not tightly bound to anything. Whereas if you just have water around, it takes a lot more effort to break that water apart. So what we need is an acid catalyst to start things off. 
because if we actually look through this this mechanism I'm going to draw it as H3O plus as hydronium because it doesn't really matter what our acid source is. We just need something to start this process. So if we draw our first step, we get our intermediate. And we, now we still have H2O around, right? And now one of the lone pairs from the oxygen can come in here and attach. What do we get after that step? We only drew one arrow, right? We only draw one arrow, that means only one bond breaking or forming. So what's the bond that's forming? What type in between one atom? Bingo. Sigma bond between the oxygen and the carbon. Which means those other bonds on the oxygen are still there. Right? So because we only drew one arrow, we only added one bond, the broke one bond. So we, we're not quite done yet, right? What's the last thing that needs to happen? What type of mechanism is that? It's going to get us to this. Oh, I had it in the middle somewhere. Sorry. What's the only difference between the oxygen with the positive charge in the final product that circles up at the top. Extra hydrogen, right? We need to get rid of an extra hydrogen. What's that type of mechanism step? We have it here. Yeah. So we just need something back to the base. We grab that extra proton. And a lot of times, since we know we have water around, because that's one of our reactions, right? A lot of times we'll have water act out of the base here, which then makes this next step make even more sense. So we have an extra water molecule that happens to be floating around if we draft that extra H plus, right? We started with an extra H3O plus. And we ended with an extra H3O plus, right? That's why the acid is written as a catalyst, because it doesn't actually get used up. The acid in this reaction is not a reactant, because you can't run out of it. I mean, I guess you could, but you regenerate that extra proton floating around just by virtue of when you add water, you have one extra proton that you need to get rid of. Yeah. So you start by having an extra proton floating around, you end with an extra proton floating around. So that's why it's not written as a reactant. You wouldn't write it as, you know, AJ for acid or something like that. Because you only need it as a catalyst. So I said it doesn't matter what acid we use here, but what we want to use, if we were trying to make isopropyl alcohol here, if we wanted to maximize that, would we want to use it? or HDR? Why not? Right, you wind up with competing reaction. You wind up, water is still there, so water could still be our nucleophile, but we also added another nucleophile in the form of chloride or bromide. 
we wind up with more side products. And so a lot of times the acid, if we're trying to do a hydration, the acid that we actually use is going to be something that the conjugate base is a really bad nucleophile. Something that's either really stable already on its own or that has something else going on. Um, most commonly, H2SO4. There's this little thing that's down in the corner. So H2SO4 because hydrogen sulfate is a really bad nucleophile. It's a much weaker nucleophile than water. Um, and so is nitrate. We don't use nitric acid as much because having too much nitrate around in the solution tends to lead to other nitrogen oxide products that are toxic or to have other side reactions that can happen. Um, but occasionally you do see nitric acid used for catalyzing things in organic chemistry. But, um, sulfuric acid is the most common one because it avoids having chlorides and bromides. All right, let's take a quick break. Since we had a short lecture today, let's only do like a six minute break. We'll come back to 20 after. And then we'll talk about how we can apply the same ideas to some other situations.
I'll reiterate for the recording. Um, when we get to this point, we have to choose something that has a to leave the oxygen. We can't end with an oxygen with a positive charge. That's not, we never want to end the reaction mechanism um, with a charged molecule. So we have to choose between the hydrogen being removed or the methyl group being removed. Hydrogens are always way more easy to remove than, than an oxygen carbon bond. There are reactions where we can pull off that methyl, but they're really pretty, um, pretty tricky relative. It's a lot easier to remove a proton reliably. So we just bring back our conjugate base. Uh, whatever our acid was is then just going to act as the base now. To steal that proton. And we wind up getting our final product. I'm going to erase this up here now for a second just so I can redraw everything better. We get our acid back. Right? So remember that if it's a catalyst, it's going to play an important role in the reaction happening, but it's not going to get used up. And interestingly enough, this also plays a, a um, it means that the rate law gets more complicated too. Because you have to have a certain amount of the acid for the reaction to start, but only to a point. So it doesn't really show up in the rate law, but the reaction can happen without it also. And there's a point, there's a, a short range of concentrations where adding acid does make the reaction go faster. But, so it might be like adding two drops of acid versus one drop of acid if your reaction mixture doubles the rate, but adding three drops has no effect whatsoever. Basically, you reach sort of a critical mass where it doesn't matter if you're adding acid if you have extra acid around, because what's really going to slow things down at that point is having more butene or having more of your alkene around, and you still need a certain amount of your nucleophile as well. So your rate laws get more complicated when you have catalysts involved, and don't even get me started on enzyme kinetics, because when you have enzymes catalyzing things, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens. You basically wind up with two different rate laws overlapped on top of each other, it makes for a really complicated function. Um, it's really cool mathematically, and really, it's, if you know how to do it on Excel, it's actually really easy to model. Um, but it's not as easy as rate equals K times concentration times concentration. Um, it's actually got a, it's got rate constant and equilibrium constants mixed in together when you have when you're doing enzyme kinetics, um, because various steps of the pathway are going to be equilibrium, and some of them are not in equilibrium. But that is, so all that to say is, I wouldn't ask you to write this rate law necessarily. Typically what we would do if we're trying to do a rate law um, examination of this reaction is we would keep the amount of the catalyst constant in all of our reactions and basically just leave it out of the rate law. Just say, okay, assuming you have adequate protons for your amount, they're not, they're not gonna affect the rate beyond that. As opposed to the other two concentrations that are fairly linear, double one, double the rate, added for them, more or less. All right. All right, quick thermodynamics question. And I've made this point several times before in one of your questions on the in class assignment. So it's asking you to make the same point as well, write an explanation yourself. If addition and elimination are the same reaction happening backwards and forwards, how do we favor one side of the reaction over the other? Bonus points if you can 
if you can uh, bring in the other reactor or make the same same logical distinction. Where else did we talk about favoring one pathway over another? What other situations we had competing reactions or competing forward and backward reactions we had competing reactions with? These are the yeah. Elimination and substitution. Right? If we had elimination and substitution, we could choose which of those pathways we favored, right? By sometimes by adjusting what the nucleophile was. But if we had a 50 50 mixture of E1 and SN1, how did we swing it one way versus the other? Temperature. We play with the entropy term. Right, because which of these two sides is going to be favored is favored by entropy. The left hand side and the right hand side is going to be favored is higher entropy. What what uh, is higher entropy? Go ahead, Ricky. Uh, they left hand side is favored because it's more random, right? More pieces means more randomness. I'll use the Legos analogy. If my kids have a Lego model with 1500 pieces and it's all assembled and set up just perfectly, there's not very much entropy in that, right? There's not very much randomness versus if that gets dropped on the floor. Now all of a sudden there's a lot of disorder. Now all of a sudden there's 1500 different ways you can arrange things. Like more pieces is means more entropy. And that means if we want to favor the side that has more entropy, we change the temperature. If we want if the side that has higher entropy is what we want. We want to increase the temperature. Higher temperature always favors higher entropy and choosing between two systems. Right? So increasing the temperature favors elimination. On the other hand, I bonds are less stable than sigma bonds, right? So if we took entropy out of it by going to a low temperature, we're going to favor the addition reaction. And we can see this mathematically too, because if if we look at let's see where it is. If we just look at our definition of K, the E to the negative delta G not over RT. When temperature increases. It gets a little bit tricky because we wind up with delta G has has a delta S times temperature in there. We actually wind up with we split it out. My log logs are a little rusty. I'm doing this on the fly. That there's a way you can so we can simplify this using lots of logs and do the substitution for the definition of delta D. Might have something close to this, and this isn't making the point that I want to make. But basically, if delta G gets more negative, K gets bigger. 
side of the equation that has more entropy gets favored and K is going to get larger or smaller according to which side of the reaction it has more entropy. Right, because as delta G changes, so does equilibrium constant for two reasons. This is, this is actually a really tricky one to actually do much math with because temperature shows up. If we wanted to do something like, and probably it's not a prereq for this class, but if we wanted to do something like differentiate K with respect to temperature, how does equilibrium constant change with respect to temperature changing? That's not an easy derivative to take because T shows up in two different places. You wind up with a fairly complicated function. It's doable. Taking a derivative is not that hard. It's not really changeable, right? Um, because you just wind up having to do it repeatedly, multiplying everything together to get something nasty at the end. Um, and it's not something that you could then take and integrate easily either. Um, so it's complicated. I don't want to use the word complex because that means something that's different than that. Um, it's a tricky mathematical function to model, but at the same time, we can generalize it just using what Chatelier is. If you change the temperature, you're going to favor the side that has higher entropy. If you increase the temperature, you're going to go to the side of the reaction that has higher entropy. Decrease the temperature, you do the opposite. All right, so this is just going through some more of the same logic. Bonds broken, and so enthalpy. Remember, it's just the, the description of the energy in the chemical bonds. So making sigma bonds is more stable than making the pi bonds. So enthalpy is always going to favor the addition reactions or substitution reactions. But entropy is going to favor the side that has more pieces, which is going to be the elimination side. And we can actually run the numbers on this. If we look at the numbers of so this is a really simple reaction. You can actually calculate this and get pretty good numbers, just um, not by hand. We can use computers to calculate this and actually wind up looking at what these different reactions, the energy of these different reactions, and come up with a potential energy surface. And we'll do that um, in third quarter, if not later this quarter. It kind of depends all on, on uh, uh, if we go back to distance learning at any point, because I kind of have to try to keep those in my back pocket at this point, or if we have to do a couple labs in a row uh, remotely, computational labs work pretty well for that. Um, but we can get numbers for this, and they can actually just measure these as well. If you look at the energy of a pi bond in ethene, it's 63 kilocalories per mole, and HCl is 103 kilocalories per mole. And if we make Two new bonds that are 101 kcals per mole and 84 kcals per mole. We actually, the bonds formed are more stable than the bonds broken. So we're downhill in entropy for this reaction by 19 kcals per mole, which you guys don't have you know, that much um, frame of reference for that, but we could actually plug that in if we assume that there was no difference in. In entropy between the two sides, you can plug in delta H into that equation for K and get an equilibrium constant. And you wind up with something that's pretty big, favors the addition pretty heavily if you ignore entropy. So at absolute zero, we can do that, right? If we say that the reaction is happening close to absolute zero, then your entropy term is basically nothing. And you can get an idea of what equilibrium constant. Entropy term though favors two separate pieces. And that's why as you get to higher temperature, you let entropy sit in the driving seat. Low temperature, it's all about entropy. High temperature, it's all about entropy. All right, we have 10 minutes. 
We're going to go through this mechanism, which is several steps. It's going to look a little intimidating at first, but then we'll start next class by going through it again. Um, and so this is the general process here is the same as hydration, as acid catalyzed hydration. Um, the overall reaction is usually just referred to as oxymercuration, although technically it should be oxymercuration, demercuration, because you have to add an oxygen and a mercury, and then you have to get rid of the mercury um, in order for it to get us all the way to an alcohol can. But that's a mouthful, so a lot of times people will just refer to it as oxymercuration. Um, and, the, and you might be asking yourself, well, why would we bother doing this when we have acid catalyzed hydration? Well, so let's look at the mechanism and see why this might be significant. So it starts by basically you have to have this. Um, Di diacetyl mercury or mercury two acetate as your starting material. If you have mercury two acetate, the mercury, we don't actually have a periodic table up on here, so we can't go to the um, uh, electron configuration. But basically, the mercury still has room in its d orbital where it can make it can accommodate. And be in a Lewis acid where it can accept electrons. And in doing so, you basically do a quick substitution reaction. So, where you wind up with this pair of electrons from the alkene bond comes in and attaches to the mercury. And one of these acetate groups basically just leaves and you just get acetate as a byproduct. Acetate is a pretty harmless molecule. Um, it's pretty stable on its own. So that happens pretty easily. And you end up with this. This is going to be a common theme here. You have these three sided rings in these intermediates that are not super stable, but with large atoms like mercury, um, bromine, iodine, you can want, they're big enough, their orbitals take up enough space, they can actually be part of a three sided ring structure. Um, and so what that does is it means you don't really have to pick which carbon gets the positive charge, right? Because neither of the carbons have an empty valence because the mercury is able to bond to both of them at the same time. Um, but if you then have a nucleophile, the nucleophile can come in here and basically give the mercury its electrons back. The mercury doesn't want to make three bonds. Mercury is most stable with only two bonds. It's only a plus two. So it only wants two extra pairs of electrons around it to satisfy its stability. It can, because it's better to have mercury with three bonds than it is to have a carbon with an empty spot in valence. But the, the next thing that happens is you wind up with your H2O coming in here and acting as a nucleophile. And it still follows Markovnikov's rule because the bond between the mercury and the primary carbon is stronger than the bond between the mercury and the secondary carbon. For the same rules, reason as carbon stability. There's less need for the mercury to be bound to the middle carbon. So you still wind up with your OH, and then you have to do a quick proton transfer to get here. You still wind up with the OH going on the more substituted carbon. And then this last step, the demercuration step, we're not going to show the mechanism for right now. Um, but basically, you just wind up completely reducing the mercury and replacing it with a hydrogen. Um, so this is not one where the mercury, the mercury is not a catalyst. The mercury is not part of our final reaction. But it's also not a catalyst because it does get used up and turned into metallic mercury over the course of this reaction. Um, and then this sodium oral hydride, NADH4. So hydrogen is less electronegative than all the non metals, right? With the exception of boron. 
Hydrogen is more electronegative than boron. So if you actually have a covalent bond between hydrogen and boron, for once, hydrogen doesn't have a partial positive. It has a partial negative instead. And so you can actually wind up with hydrogen acting as a nucleophile in this case. So basically, the, the overall mechanism is a little trickier because you need to have enough oral hydride to reduce the mercury as well. But the, you wind up with hydrogen with a negative charge basically acting as a nucleophile and booting the mercury off. So by changing the order that this happens, by having hydrogen act as hydride as a nucleophile, we can go, we go into the same net results as acid catalyzed hydration, but with a very different mechanism, right? Very complex looking mechanism at first. Um, but again, this second step, the demercuration, we're not going to spend as much time on because metals get really weird when it comes to reduction reactions. Um, and basically, the second step is just as a get rid of the mercury. So, why, why this winds up being really helpful is it because it gives us the same reaction but through a different mechanism, and this mechanism doesn't have a carbocation in it, does it? Which, why is that significant in terms of synthesis? Or just in terms of the products that you would make? What won't happen if you don't have a carbocation in it? Rearrangements, no more rearrangements. Which means if you have if you have an alkene and a tertiary carbon next to it, you can control this and basically not allow it to go through a rearrangement by using oxymergeration instead of acid catalyzed hydration. So this is basically a, a tool. We're going to when we start getting more and more into synthesis, we're going to start adding more and more tools to be more specific about where our our functional groups get added. So this allows us where we can let it rearrange if we want to let it rearrange, or we cannot let it rearrange. We have control over that by going to the getting to what's more or less the same reaction, but through a different pathway. I'm trying to keep this big traffic metaphor in there somewhere. I'm sure I'm really sure I could come up with one, but I don't want to mix mix and match what we're doing before. So all right, so last one, I'm going to do an A on here. Just really quick. If this was, if we went through, so this is how we write oxymercuration, demercuration. Two steps. The first step is that mercury to acetate and the nucleophile, in this case, water. Then the second step is the sodium borohydride. Which is just going to, which is get rid of the mercury and replace it with either. So if we go through oxymercuration, it doesn't matter that we are next to a tertiary carbon, actually a quaternary carbon. No rearrangement can happen. If we went through acid catalyzed hydration, Draw it over here, but in red, color code this. We could get, we wind up with a methyl shift and wind up with our OH being added here. Right, we wind up with carbocation arrangement. So, two, I mean, maybe not two at first sight, they don't look that different. But if one of these, if one of these is a pesticide and the other one is a medication, it kind of matters which version we get, right? And putting the OH in the wrong spot or allowing a rearrangement can really, really cause a big problem. And so, not allowing that, being very specific about which mechanism to use is a big deal. All right. We will end there for today. Um, and just think that more, most of what I wanted to get through today is by the start. So, did you have a little homework assignment for this week that you can be working on during when you have some downtime in lab? So there's going to be a little bit of hurry up and wait, like usual in chemistry. Um, but uh, I will see everybody there at 
one o'clock, and then we're in the G building. So best way to get there from here, you go down that stairway by Bruce and Larry's office, right around the corner here, it's downstairs by the bio lab, outside, and then follow the sidewalk over there. It's G3. If anybody doesn't know the campus well enough or wants me to walk in over there, that's where my office is too. So I'll be heading over there right now. I can show you if you're worried about running over there. 